Welcome to the Mindspace Podcast. I'm Joe Flanders. Thanks for tuning in. The Mindspace Podcast is my personal in-depth exploration of the science and practice of well-being. I'm sharing this journey with you because I believe we can all lead a happier and more meaningful life by getting the facts and training our minds. Join me as I learn and share the most inspiring insights about human flourishing from leading experts, because we could all use a little more Mindspace. So, incredibly exciting episode today. I had the enormous privilege of interviewing Mathieu Ricard, who is arguably the most well-known guest I've had on the podcast so far. For those of you that don't know Mathieu, uh, he is a French Buddhist monk and a best-selling author. He's sometimes referred to as the happiest man in the world. And this is because in the year 2000, his brain was scanned in an imaging study and He exhibited never-before-seen activation in certain parts of his brain, and uh, that landed him the nickname. But in my view, what's even more interesting about Mathieu is his background. He got a PhD in molecular genetics in 1972 in his native France. And instead of going on to a successful academic career like his father, philosopher Jean-François Revel, he decided to move to Nepal and become a Buddhist monk dedicating his life to training his mind and making the world a better place. He's been there ever since. So he has a truly unique perspective on health and well-being. There's literally no other human being on the planet who better understands the intersection of contemplative practice and contemporary science. And he brings this perspective to a variety of work activities, including contributing to scientific research on meditation, writing books, translating ancient Buddhist texts, and public speaking around the world. He also happens to be the Dalai Lama's French interpreter and close friend. Mathieu is also highly active as a humanitarian. In the year 2000, he created Karuna Shechen, an organization providing primary health care and education and social services for the underserved populations of India, Nepal, and Tibet. And all of the proceeds of his books, his photographs, and events are donated to this cause. Really cool to announce that uh, you can actually see Mathieu speak live in Montreal later this month. So Karuna Canada, which is the Canadian chapter of his organization, is putting on a conference and a concert on April 13th at the Maison Symphonique of Place des Arts. The event is called taking care of life it will be in french and the details can be found at karunacanada.org so that should be a very cool event and you will probably see me there a couple of other quick notes about this episode before we get to it number one the sound quality is pretty bad Um, this is because when we spoke metsu was actually visiting his mother in the french countryside and the only connection we had Uh, was through a landline. So what you're hearing is actually a direct recording of that phone call. So we did our best to clean it up in the post-production phase, uh, and this is the best we could do. So hopefully it's not too much of an obstacle for you. Second, because this was an unusual and interesting moment, an interview, I decided to play the audio of the entire phone call including the initial introduction and setup of the interview. Now, that part was done in French, and then we did transition to English for the actual interview. Um, So if you don't understand French, don't worry about it. Um, This is a very brief exchange, and then we switch into English for the interview. And finally, if you'd like to learn about meditation, deepen an existing meditation practice, or learn more about how you might integrate mindfulness into your organization, please check out our programming at mindspacewellbeing.com or presencemeditation.ca. Now, as for the interview itself, it is relatively brief, but I do feel we covered some very interesting ground, including his perspective on the explosion of mindfulness in the West in the last 20 years, developments in the science of meditation, what strikes Matthew most when he visits Western countries, and his advice for people who want to cultivate a happier life. And now, without further delay, I bring you my interview with Mathieu Ricard. Hi, 
Allô euh, Bonjour, Monsieur Ricard. Oui, bonjour. Bonjour, ça va très bien et vous Ça va parfaitement. Est-ce que vous êtes confortable Vous êtes prête pour... Euh... Oui, c'est très bien. Et vous voulez parler en anglais Si ça ne vous dérange pas. Ok, c'est bon. Super. Et encore une fois, merci euh, de trouver le temps pour ça. Euh, c'est vraiment intéressant, vraiment euh, très belle opportunité pour, pour moi et mon communauté ici. Alors, euh, je vous remercie euh, vraiment. So we can switch to English. OK, very good, very good. OK, so my first question is that um, I've been practicing meditation myself for about 20 years. And I've been really blown away, even kind of shocked by how much mindfulness meditation has exploded in Western culture. And you, of course, have uh, an even like a much richer and uh, a deeper relationship with this practice. I'm just curious to hear from you. What is it like from your perspective to see how meditation has really moved into the mainstream in Western culture? Well, first of all, I think it's nice to not define, uh, sort of put meditation in context. You know, in Sanskrit, bhavana means to cultivate something. And in Tibetan, gom means to become familiar with something. So you could cultivate focused attention, compassion, benevolence, inner balance. And you could become familiar with the thought process, the fundamental nature of mind behind the stream of thought. So there's a lot of things you can be, you could become familiar with. And so, Roughly, it's sort of mind training. And, uh, you know, the whole Buddhist part is about uh, getting rid of the causes of suffering. And the causes of suffering, of course, some are obvious, like hatred and craving and so forth. Some are less obvious, which is uh, like a distortion of reality, for which wisdom is the only remedy. So familiarization is also familiarization with... Uh, a correct understanding of reality is much more vast than what usually people call meditation uh, and, and even faster than the technical definition of mindfulness, which of course there are quite a few, but basically is to pay attention uh, undistractedly to the present moment uh, in a non-judgmental way and notice whatever happens without losing that mindfulness. Uh, we call that uh, attentive presence in Buddhism is not quite non-judgmental because it's connected with uh, an evaluation of whether what you notice in the present moment is wholesome and unwholesome, not in a kind of moralistic way, but in the terms of uh, whether it brings suffering or freedom from suffering, but more in a, in a practical way, and therefore if something that brings suffering is undesirable, so the other aspect of being mindful of is what could be the antidote, say, to hatred, and then put the antidote in action in a proper way. So then, you know, put in this context, it's of course much faster. And then even that is put in the vaster scope of a very rich uh, array of uh, methods which constitute the path from suffering to freedom from suffering, which is extremely vast. There's a philosophical aspect, an analytical aspect, practical aspect, and so forth. So now, of course, when uh, my dear friend John kabat got the idea that uh, there was a lot of suffering, especially in the medical world, from patients, from caregivers, and he was wondering how to use some of the techniques that he had learned mostly in Burma and other places to Buddhist practices in a way that could be acceptable 30 years ago in a medical setting, which was uh, you know, not very open to the idea of bringing some weird exotic practices. So the idea of uh, stress would be one of the main factors and the mindfulness being able to reduce the stress was already a kind of threat of genius and recently I witnessed John reviewing 30 years of uh, expansion of the impact of mindfulness on healthcare uh, and then in other fields of life. And it was truly moving and uh, amazing. So this being said, it's been never pretended to be the essence of Buddhism. I think John clearly says also it's inspired by Buddhism, but it's not an uh, integral Buddhist practice. The only problem would be uh, for those people who say, oh, that's the essence of Buddhism, that's much too simplistic, obviously. And also, 
one issue might be that if it comes out of the medical world, which is as done now in big way, going to corporate world, you might worry that it might be used as in an instrumental way to make people more efficient, productive, and while remaining less stressed. I don't think this has materialized as, as a genuine cause of concern. Nevertheless, if when John and his team and later on many others have done that in a medical context, then of course they were there with a compassionate attitude to, to reduce suffering. So to make sure that, uh, you know, this is not disembodied from that compassion or what John called, John Kabazin called heartfulness, I believe that instead of having two things, you know, mindfulness, heartfulness, if you just speak of caring mindfulness, then you cannot go astray into a, a sort of cold tool to just be more attentive for whatever uh, instrumental purpose that could be completely devoid of ethics and compassion. So meditation is vaster than that. Buddhist path is vaster than meditation, but there's nothing wrong with this mindfulness revolution which has this tremendous good throughout the world. What do you think the risk is of using mindfulness instrumentally? I'm worried about that, but then a, a friend of mine, uh, a French uh, guy called Sébastien Henri, I think his book is in English also, he interviewed 100 CEOs who had decided to incorporate mindfulness in their, at their workplace. And it was very interesting because first they were, they hesitated because they said, oh, maybe people would become less motivated, I mean, more soft. And then they, it's a waste of time. Maybe they will use too much time. But then what they found is actually something quite different. They found that there was two main advantages, which was not just to make people more efficient. That's not what happened. The two advantages were having better judgment because they saw things in a bigger sort of way, bigger perspective, from different perspective. And then second thing was improving of, of even relationship to in the in the in the enterprise. So those two things are of course much welcome. So so far, I mean of course I'm not a specialist because I don't work in corporate world, but I haven't heard much of someone say, "Oh, look in, my, in this company, they are just use that to relentlessly push people harder and use the mindfulness to make them less stressed while pushing them like crazy." So this worry didn't happen, but I think since compassion and care is such an important thing, personally, my humble suggestion would be to always speak of caring mindfulness, so then at least you always put compassion and loving kindness in the forefront. And many studies right now put more and more emphasizes on the benefit of practicing compassion and loving kindness mm -hmm. to the extent that Denjimba, who is also in Canada and who is the president of, or the chairman of uh, Mind and Life Institute. I remember we were together in Singapore presenting the work of Mind and Life and he says after the mindfulness revolution, now maybe we're heading to the compassion revolution. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this would be great. I wanted to talk about the science because of course, that's one of the reasons why mindfulness has grown so much in the West. And of course, you've been a really important um, figure in in advancing the science. I'm curious, how do you think science in general is doing? How much progress is it making in understanding the Buddhist uh, wisdom around well-being and uh, the reduction of suffering? So, you know, I, although I've participated in a lot of studies as collaborator, co-author, guinea pig, everything, <laughs> uh, I'm not practicing mindfulness in the technical way it is uh, done in MBSR. So, decided that uh, initially with Francisco Varela, then Richard Davidson, and Antoine Lutz, and later with uh, Tanya Singer, and uh, Stephen Lawrence, who is one of the world specialists on consciousness, to focus, to simplify things because there are so many ki kinds of meditation. And when you speak of meditation, it's like mind training. So you could train your mind in so many things. It's like physical training. You know, what are you doing? You know, football or, or volleyball is, or, or, or chess, you know, it's different. So we decided that there was three types of traditional meditation that could be useful to society 
and usable in a secular context. And one was, of course, focused attention. Uh, that's probably the closest to mindfulness. The other one was uh, compassion or altruistic love. And the third one is what we call open presence, which is uh, roughly defined as a very open, vast, vivid state, uh, which is in our, I mean, the taxonomy is somehow deeper than mindfulness because it's resting also in the deepest nature of mind. So those three have been extensively studied. They have different signature in the brain. There's no doubt that they do change the brain functionally and structurally. So that's one of the many studies I've been involved uh, with those labs. And uh, they are mostly uh, about fundamental research. Uh, while mindfulness has been studied a lot in a clinical context uh, to see what sort of uh, good effect they could have on health, which they have. And so that field is a lot, a lot of studies. I think John Kavazin showed that, you know, 20 years ago, there was four or five publications every year, and I think now it's 400. So, but uh, what I've been involved is for fundamental research on different types of meditation. And then at a later stage, recently, I've been involved in a vast uh, study, European study on aging and whether meditation will uh, slow down the aging process, which... Uh, the pilot study done on long-term meditators shows that definitely it seems that uh, long-term meditators have uh, structurally and uh, metabolically a, a younger brain, sometimes at 10 to 15 years than the average. And also I've been involved in study on the different levels of consciousness, of vividness, of clarity with Stephen Lawrence. And also with Tanya Singer, uh, we did uh, quite a few... I think, groundbreaking study to distinguish empathy from compassion and show that uh, when people speak of compassion fatigue, it's not the right term. You should speak of empathy fatigue or a sort of emotional exhaustion that leads to burnout, but that compassion, at the opposite, is more like an antidote to burnout and is something that replenishes your strength and courage while uh, if you empathic resonance with suffering overburden you and overwhelms you as the suffering of others is uh, repeated. So all these have been fascinating uh, collaborations and to show also that a meditator is not just a guinea pig but a co-conceiver of the protocols. So they asked me to co-sign the paper, although I'm not involved in crunching the data, <laughs> but because we sort of established the protocol together, so they thought it's uh, important to acknowledge that the meditators are, are, have an active role in the research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that as well. You've got this really unique uh, setup where I believe part of the year you're living as a monastic in Nepal and part of the year you're living Western uh, in a Western culture in France. Um, what is it yeah, like well, to go back and forth between these two contexts? Well, 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 you know, yes and no, because I, I only spend a few days in Paris, even though usually what happens when I'm there, I do a lot of public things and media and stuff because of the books and all these things. Uh, but I increasingly spend more time either in my hermitage in Nepal or take, looking after humanitarian projects. Our organization, Karuna Sechen, which actually organizes the, the next uh, event in, in Montreal in April, the uh, Journée Emergence, uh, now helps 250,000 people every year in India, Nepal, and Tibet. And so I'm very much involved in that. I started this organization. So, and then in France, I'm mostly staying with my 95 years old mother in the countryside, and my teachers are here, or some of my teachers are here. Even though I make a little noise when I go to Paris because the media will always want to ask you things. But in fact, I don't spend much time immersed in the, in city life and in the, in sort of, well, the modern way of life. Okay, so in the moments where you are, um, let's say, um, speaking to the media or exposed to urban life, even for short periods, what jumps out at you the most as sort of different or unusual or even problematic about our lifestyle? Well, I mean, I, I'm not a, I'm a part of the world, and uh, 
of course, uh, as a former scientist, I've been doing a, an passionate research really about the question of the need for more altruism and cooperation for our time. I'm very much involved with the environment scientist. So I'm involved in too many things, in fact. Well, it's quite clear that the main, 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 main challenge for the 21st century is climate change and the, and the degradation of the ecosystem, the dramatic loss of biodiversity and of the population of uh, living species on Earth. And that could jeopardize every other project progress that has been done in a vast way over the last two centuries. So, well, I'm concerned by that, obviously, because if we, if you think that altruism is the best solution to those challenges, then you cannot but not be deeply concerned by the fate of future generation and of eight million other species who are co-citizens on this earth. So concerned, definitely, I'm so deeply concerned. Now, whatever I can do is not very much, but at least participating in the debate, writing books, you know, having a little voice here and there, having sometime, you know, gone to weird places like the World Economic Forum or the UN to speak about those things. So whatever, you know, I can. But uh, uh, if I was just on my own, of course, it's like zero influence. But together with many people from, coming from many fields of life, whether they are environment scientists or policy makers or uh, economists that more emphasizes on caring economics and all kinds of people who really want to try to build a better world even despite this, this incredible challenge that we are facing. So I'm just part of this community and uh, do my best to contribute you know, even modestly to to bring some cultural change. I don't know where it will lead, but we're trying our best. So um, we have... To answer your question, yeah. but clearly, you know, there's a big problem with the the society of, of consumerism. Uh, if you think that the North American uh, U.S. citizen, average U.S. citizen, emits 200 times more CO2 than a Zambian, the citizen of Qatar emits 2,000 times more CO2 than an Afghani. So there's a problem there. And so it's not so much to, that we should prevent that the poor countries who have gathered access to a minimum of energy or fully renewable energy to have access to education and health and so forth, is simply that the rich countries should just stop that crazy overconsumption, uh, which they don't seem to be ready to do. Uh, and they, they think that uh, they can't be happy having less, but in fact it's just rather the opposite. And voluntary simplicity is one of the source of great happiness and freedom. But uh, So that's what I think the main sort of blindness of modern society is this constant drive for consumerism, for all kinds of things, uh, which doesn't bring happiness. You know, it has been shown over and again. It's not just a moralistic Buddhist view. Study like people from like Tim Kasser, uh, who did a 20-year study on the effect of consumerism. He has a very interesting book called The High Price of Materialism. I show it simply doesn't make people happier. They are less happy, they are less healthy, they have less good, genuine friends, they are less concerned by global issues, they are less empathetic. Yes, yeah, so this kind of drive is not good for anybody. So that's so regrettable, and, but I don't know how much people are ready to give it up. They think they will be less happy, they will be deprived of something good, while it's just simplification brings such a freedom. No house, no car, no land, no nothing, I'm so happy like that. I dread to have to take care of all those that's one of the things that has inspired me about your work is this really interesting possibility that there are actions that we could take simplicity um, cutting down on consumerism that are both good for the planet good for our communities and ultimately enhancing of our own well-being how, how do you it's see those things as, you know, how do those things fit together Stop eating meat, it's so easy, it takes five seconds. And this, this will be one of the factors, which would be the, one of the easiest things to do to palliate climate change. And uh, the, the latest report of the IPCC said if we keep on increasing, just the factor of increasing meat consumption, that 
alone will forbid us to stay below two degrees Celsius of warming. That simple thing is the second industrial farming and crop uh, cattle raising for meat is the second cause of greenhouse gas emission. The second one because of the methane and the, uh, all those stuff. This is crazy. I mean, it could be so easy to change that. It just takes a, a little decision. It doesn't mean that you change drastically other things of way of life. There's so many things like that that we could do. But isn't it the case that some of these things that we could take not only would have a positive impact on the world, but it would also make us happier, like investing in relationships? And happier, but that's the, you know, no, the Buddhist is very clear about that. We wish for happiness, but on our back to the cause of happiness. We don't want to suffer, but we run toward the cause of suffering. This is one of the main Buddhist statements. And even I had a Buddhist uh, teacher who said, what you call happiness here, we call it suffering. Hmm. So that was a pretty terse statement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what did he, what did he, what does that mean exactly? What did he mean by that? It means that when people look for happiness in, you know, remaining young forever, wealth, power, uh, fame, so rank in society, uh, you know, extrixing value, the latest fashionable clothes, the latest model of this and that, the latest car, having a flashy home with lots of staff, and then adding to that the endless succession of pleasurable experiences, which are more like a recipe for exhaustion. So you add all that together, you are completely fooled by this kind of uh, looking for happiness totally in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So no surprise, that's called lack of discernment or ignorance. So... That's it. No, those things simply don't bring genuine, lasting happiness or fulfillment or contentment. Where should people be looking for happiness and contentment, or not looking at all? Well, I mean, there's, uh, you know, first, I mean, I, I try to write a book about that. First, distinguish that happiness is not the same thing as just pleasant sensation. It's a way of being, and that is not just one thing, of course. It comes with a cluster of qualities like inner freedom, inner peace, inner strength, compassion, altruistic love, uh, not an overinflated sort of strength of, of ego, not excessive self-centeredness. There's all kinds of hum basic human qualities. And the good news is all those can be cultivated as skills. And that's where also, you know, mind training and neuroplasticity comes into picture. So when all those are being brought to the optimal point, then you have a fulfilled life, a sense of resilience, of strength, of inner freedom. You have the inner resources to deal with ups and downs of life. So it has nothing to do with the perpetual seeking of, of pleasant sensation, which simply also doesn't work. There's nothing wrong with pleasure, but it's simply not the same thing as a sense of deep fulfillment. Mm -hmm. So... What we're up against here is um, a challenge of educating people to change their behavior. Well, that's to why, you know, at the end, you start writing books, or hopefully with the hope that you will gather enough scientific and philosophical and experiential evidence. And then, you know, it's just a little drop in the ocean that all together with many other trends of ideas and thought makes our culture. So culture are shifting with time. So let's see what will come up. Is it a more cooperative, altruistic, happier society? Or will we continue to go toward the narcissistic epidemics like it, it is we can see in North America? So I don't know. Let's see. I'm very aware of the you know proliferation of good science and um, you know good books and persuasive arguments like the work you're doing. But there's also a terrible rise of, of um, partisanship and um, difficulty understanding the other side of debates. Uh, I'm, you know, think yeah. this is partly um, due to the rise of social media. What is your take on that as an obstacle to improving? Yeah, it is a contrary force. Um, well, that's well known. So again, I don't know which one will win over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a they are buoyant. You can see those forces at play. And I think the main research work I did is the book on altruism. 
and uh, I had to explore those uh, antagonist forces because otherwise I would have been naive just to say that altruism is the solution, that it exists, that we can enhance it, and that's it. But of course, there are so many things like the the, the, the cause of violence, the, what makes us a, a psychopath, why, how can we commit genocide, how can we make wholesale massacres of animals, all these things. And then what are the solutions for education, to go into a sustainable harmony, to more caring economics, to global governance. So, you know, this is a huge fault uh, of reflection upon all those issues. Uh, you know, I tried to myself, along with many other friends, spent many years trying to formulate all those things and analyze them. So I sort of have done what I could. Now I'm a bit old and I want to go back to contemplative life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I'm not much to add, you know. <laughs> I sort of did my best with my humble, limited capacity on the subject that I felt really were important. And I think now it's time to move to something else. Well, I think uh, I can speak for my listeners and, and for myself that we hope you keep going as, as much as you can because um, I think you're doing some really important work. Uh, we do have an opportunity here with the people that are listening. If there is one thing that you would like to ask people to do or one suggestion um, for how people might yeah. begin to both improve uh, the world around them and cultivate their own well-being, what, what, would, what would you advise people to do? Well, it's very simple. On a personal level, cultivate loving kindness, compassion, benevolence. And on a global level, feel a sense of, of a global respons- universal responsibility. And no, don't stop to your close ones, but extend the circle to all sentient beings and even to future generations. So if we does expand the scope and the circle of our sort of compassion, then I think that's the best way we could go, both ourselves and for society. So I think if altruism or altruistic love or whatever you call it, uh, is the twofold accomplishment of others' good and your own good, and it's the only way to reconcile the immediate needs to fulfill one's needs for survival and so forth, it's through cooperation, kindness, and so forth. The mid-term wish, uh, needs of flourishing in life and the long-term needs of caring for the future generation, for other species, for the planet. Because competition and selfishness will not do the job. So if we realize that from the intellect and from the heart, and then I think if we can cultivate is compassion in our own life. That's the very best thing we could do both for ourselves and for others. Thank you very much for, for saying that. And I, I really appreciate the message and I hope our listeners do as well. Is, <laughs> okay. it, is there anything else that you'd like to add that you feel well, we didn't cover? Uh, in, uh, yes. In this spirit, I think in next April, we are trying to organize a beautiful meeting in Montreal on the subject of taking care of life. And so we'll have people of all walks of life, including neuroscientists. Uh, we have a witness who spent 15 years as inspector in slaughterhouses. And we have a wonderful artist like Maria Jao Pires, a great pianist. Uh, we have Alexandre Jolien, who is a Swiss handicapped philosopher, which whom I did a book called In Search of Wisdom. So I think uh, this kind of event bringing really, really, and also a lot of people from Canada, like uh, Rémi Tremblay and others. So to bring this kind of idea to a live audience as part of our service and try to, you know, to be part of that cultural change and hopefully a little bit towards a better world. And I will definitely make uh, all the information about that event available on the show notes uh, for this then, episode. Uh, also, the proceed of all that will yes. go to our... Uh, Karuna Secha and Yemen projects in Asia. So it's like, again, it's also it's like the twofold fulfillment of one's own uh, aspiration and that of others. Okay, well, once again, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, this has been great, and I uh, can't wait to see you in Montreal. Okay, take care. Okay, you Bye-bye. too. Bye bye.
Thanks for listening to the Mindspace podcast. The purpose of this project is to inspire people to cultivate well-being. The science tells us that well-being is best understood as a series of skills and habits that can be learned and practiced. And I hope listening to these episodes helps you move forward on your own path to well-being. If you enjoy listening to the Mindspace podcast, please share your favorite episodes with friends, family, and colleagues. Thanks a lot.